we are live and uh, good evening if you are tuning in from um, Australia or Indonesia or the Far East. Uh, it's in the, I think like eight o'clock in uh, Sydney, just a few minutes past. And if you're in Southeast Asia, uh, early good evening to you. And if you're in the US, an early riser uh, on the East Coast, uh, um, a good morning to you. And, and good afternoon to those who tune in from Europe. And uh, our subject today um, is, is rather pressing and, and rather important for those of us who are uh, concerned about the, you know, the uh, the erosion of uh, protection of human rights, uh, the rule of law. I mean, I would I should add the, the rule of just law, not just any old law. Um, and also, we are concerned about particularly the autocratic or authoritarian regimes in places like the Philippines and Myanmar. These are usual suspects that, that have been subject to the International Court of uh, International Criminal Court, ICC's um, investigation. And I think the Philippines under Duterte um, that withdrew from the ICC Rome statute and Myanmar, uh, Myanmar has never uh, been a signatory state, uh, never signed up to ICC. But nonetheless, both states have been subject to ICC investigations. <laughs> and so um, our distinguished guest today is uh, Professor Gil uh, Beringer. Uh, he's an American trained at the Hastings in San Francisco. Um, that's a law school that Kamala Harris also was educated. So, you know, that's a different <laughs> subject. As you, you know, love our, our uh, my beloved colleague is cut from a different uh, ideological cloth than the U.S. vice president. But anyway, uh, the, he is a retired dean of law at uh, Macquarie University in Sydney, and he's uh, there as honorary research fellow. And he also chairs or co-chairs the uh, monitoring committee from uh, on the lawyers attacks. Um, with the Association of People's Lawyer. Um, now, Professor Beringer, of the, a very much a warm welcome to you. This is uh, the second time that you came on, uh, on this subject in particular. You talked about uh, the attacks on lawyers in the Philippines during Duterte's um, uh, administrations. And now uh, you will uh, draw comparative uh, um, you know, remarks on both Myanmar and uh, Philippines. So you're also very familiar with the Myanmar situation as a member of the panel of judges uh, of the uh, Permanent People's Tribunal that looked into the uh, genocidal intent uh, of the state towards a Muslim minority, uh, Rohingyas and uh, Gachin Christian minority. So without further ado, can you give us definition of attacks on lawyers? I can. Thank you for your uh, generous introduction, Zarni. Uh, I think it's best um, to read, and it's brief, but to read our definition, because of being a lawyer, I want to get it absolutely correct. Um, it's broader than uh, most other monitoring groups would accept, but I'll try to explain that uh, later. We think it's important um, to define it broadly uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, certainly to be able to understand sociologically the activities that are going on uh, in, in these different uh, countries under usually authoritarian uh, rulers. So the, the definition used by the International Association of People's Lawyers is uh, in two parts. Section one, it includes actions, physical or non-physical, directed at a legal professional or professionals that are intended to or have the natural effect of interfering with the performance of their professional duties. And secondly, actions, physical or non-physical, against a legal professional or former legal professional that are likely to impact negatively 
upon other legal professionals capacity or willingness and that's important willingness to carry out their professional duties in whole or in part without fear or favor so um, the first one is fairly clear this means any kind of physical attack killing abduction uh, or non-physical uh, disbarring for example as as is done now in uh, China certainly uh, in in other countries uh, Myanmar uh, I, I understand um, but and, and defamation is another tool that is used uh, to keep uh, legal professionals quiet but the second one is is interesting and here is where we go a little bit beyond most of the other monitoring groups um, in these countries such as Myanmar and the Philippines and and I might say I, I have data on South Africa about this the, the 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 fear that gets into the legal profession as a result of people being killed in particular or attacked physically or jailed uh, unfairly un unjust uh, with an unjust uh, motive um, and we have some evidence that this this fear is important um, in the Philippines in in Mindanao, uh, a much troubled province, of course, where a lot of killings take place. Uh, in in one province, Surigao del Norte, the local branch of the legal profession, the in integrated bar of the Philippines. Uh, made a comment a statement after the killing of of a, a judge there and and two others in the recent weeks and they said that they would no longer handle drug cases until something was done um, to investigate and arrest and convict the perpetrators um, and we have evidence that that in other parts of of the philippines and in other countries South Africa, for example, the the, the uh, attacks on lawyers are so serious that people begin not to want to take cases. Now, I've I've been reading the Human Rights Watch report on the attacks on lawyers in Myanmar, and it's very clear. One of the first things that that, that is said in that report is that uh, many lawyers will are are terribly afraid of taking political cases in particular and many just find a way of of you know being absent from from, from refusing to take up the case so uh, i th i think our our definition is 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 useful and uh it's uh it's it's been a a, a fascinating task uh, that we've we've taken on but it, it's it's tragic the killings around the globe in killings and and other other kinds of attacks preventing lawyers from doing their professional duty therefore uh depriving the people of these countries uh australia being one us being another the uk we have a list of 132 countries where there are credible reports of you know significant attacks on legal professionals and once the legal professionals are essentially out of the process, you really can get due process. Uh, you, you cannot um, expect to have a rule of just law, as you, as you uh, pointed out, it should be. Yeah, no, uh, we are focusing on only two countries comparatively. Uh, the Philippines under Marco, uh, <clears throat> the Duterte, and then the current administration, uh, relatively young, of like Marcos Jr. and Myanmar uh, during the post-coup um, period, you know, like two and a half years or so. But the, from the list of countries that you provided as an addendum, you know, 130 out of say like close to 200 countries. In other words, uh, UN member states, you know, that's 130 out of almost 200 is really a astounding number 
of uh, political states uh, who, you know, who essentially whose mission is to uphold the rule of law and enforce the, um, you know, the uh, just and fair application of the law, as you put it, like a due process, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, in the UK, uh, as well as USA, and where you are, Australia, you know, a lot of um, uh, lawyers fighting against uh, extractive industries like, you know, like mining oil and whatnot, they come under increasing threats, you know, in, in, in a lot of places like Brazil, you know, under uh, Bolsonaro, the indigenous community is fighting back uh, using legal and other means and, and lawyers who stand up for them, they disappear or, or journalists and lawyers, right? And so the, the rule of law uh, within the context of um, even nominal democracies uh, is a fundamental check against the abuses of power by the executive. And so if the, the um, both the legal profession and the manipulation of the law itself are being you know, uh, resorted to by these regimes, um, what are the other recourses, in your opinion, um, that uh, human rights defenders, rights defenders, you know, uh, the uh, uh, LGBT rights defenders, you know, uh, women's rights defend, abortion rights? Well, what, what 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 other recourses do they have when you have both the executive branch acting essentially murderously? You know, we're, we're talking about like murdering lawyers and terrorizing them psychologically. Mm -hmm. What, what are the other uh, defenses that these uh, human rights communities and uh, citizens um, have? Well, that's a good, <laughs> a good question. Um, let, let me say, first of all, uh, our list is 132 out of almost 200 countries. Uh, that does not mean that there are no attacks in the other 70 countries. Uh, countries. It means that we don't have information from those countries. And I would say most of the countries we don't have information from are probably fairly uh, authoritarian states, or in that direction at least. Um, and that's one reason we don't get the information. So um, it, is a, it is a global a global problem. Some people have called it an epidemic. Um, but unlike an epidemic, uh, we don't have public health measures that, that, that are bound to work. Um, one, one of the reasons I'm glad to be with you on this uh, broadcast is that the main thing that these states do not like is publicity of the kind that you provide in your dialogues. Um, they're really, it's very difficult to protect lawyers if, if uh, state forces who are often involved wish to deal with them, kill them or abduct them. Um, so it, it's really important that we keep these issues alive in the public domain. Um, there, there is the International Criminal Court, uh, but that's not been a very effective mechanism, except in a, you know, in a certain number of uh, cases. Um, <coughs> excuse me. You mentioned that President Duterte had withdrawn from the International Criminal Court, but in fact, uh, because he's being uh, investigated for uh, crimes that occurred before he withdrew. Um, the withdrawal is is null and void to that extent. I mean, they are they are out, but he can still be prosecuted for, it. and that that's that is important. Um, and one of the reasons that it's important is that a lot of people uh, have produced uh, an amazing amount of research. <clears throat> Organizations like the National Union of Public Lawyers in in uh, in uh, the Philippines, Lawyers for Lawyers, a Dutch organization, uh, Rappler, 
uh, which you will know is is a, is a marvelous uh, journalistic enterprise in the Philippines, under attack from Duterte, uh, of course. Um, so, and and the other thing, of course, is is mass support. Um, it 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 really requires the 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 risen people, as they used to say in in Ireland. Um, you know, a, a country unfree uh, need, needs needs uh, militancy amongst the people. Uh, there are some specific technical ways that that lawyers can be protected to some extent. Uh, my view is only to a small extent, and that is by arming them. But who wants to go around with with a gun? And if someone wants to kill you. They're going to, you know, they usually travel at least in twos and sometimes in packs. Uh, they're going to have more guns. Uh, getting a security guard in a country like the Philippines uh, very occasionally has forced, forestalled uh, a killing of, of a lawyer, usually the, the killing of the perpetrator, um, but only in a few cases. And very often the security guard gets killed. Or sometimes if it's a police-supplied security, they may not show up. Uh, I mean, there are all kinds of tricks that are, that are operating in, in this, in this um, process. So, um, yeah, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a difficult task. And, and these people who are uh, our, our lawyers defending us and the environment they're courageous people. Right. Um, and and that's, I, I, that's another reason why we want a wide definition to memorialize those people so that people know who gave their lives uh, for, for justice for the people and the environment. Right. I mean, you know, the, you, uh, <clears throat> you were brought up in and educated in the United States. And, uh, you know, we are here talking about a particularly small number of members of the legal profession, because uh, if you look at top law schools in the United States, uh, you know the the overwhelming percentage of graduates go into, you know the the corporate law, lucrative practice, and uh, you know the the defending the rights of activists, uh, minorities, uh, you know the indigenous people or the environment. Uh, is not a uh, lucrative profession to start, yeah. and so yeah. you know, like that's why, like you know, one of the uh, <clears throat> uh, the quotes that struck me, you know, from the uh, uh, legal blog uh, that I uh, I was uh, reading as a background reading was that our numbers are dwindling. You know, quoting the Burmese lawyer, uh, the you know the. The people who really are passionate about and principle about human rights, uh, they choose, uh, uh, you know, less money and greater risk profession, um, standing up for the the rights of the persecuted or minorities or the wretched, yeah. right? Yeah. And so now, like the, the, your second definition involves the uh, or the component of your, uh, you know, attacks on lawyers definition involve. Uh, uh, non-physical, but nonetheless still terrifying, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the psychological impact, you know. Mm. The, the, I mean, you you um, decided uh, some lawyers in the Philippines saying, we're not going to take on the uh, cases involving, uh, you know, the, uh, the drugs. The drug. Yeah. And so I, 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 can you can you talk about the... Um, uh, or can you break down when you say, uh, you know, lawyers or legal, we're actually talking about uh, legal professionals, you know, the, the, I mean, it's, uh, lawyers are the overwhelming number of people are subjected to, but there are also other members of the legal profession yeah. who also yeah. uh, deserve to be uh, highlighted. Yeah. When, when we say lawyers, we include attorneys or as the Europeans say, advocates, um, Prosecutors and judges, we, we include all three. Lawyers for Lawyers, for example, only looks at private practitioners. 
uh, and other groups look at others. Uh, but that we include all of those. Um, and um, in and pa paralegals in, in, and other researchers, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. well, we, we, we do include uh, legal workers and paralegals. Uh, they're, they're, uh, there's a marvelous uh, group in the Philippines called Karapatan. It's a, uh, um, you know, human rights organization. I think we used to call it civil 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 liberties, but um, they have first responders who go when someone is killed, be a lawyer, or a doctor, or, um, you know, political activist, environmental defender. All these people are being killed in the Philippines. Um, religious trade union leaders, nearly 70 of them, trade union officials, I should say, um, and peasants, of course. So when Karapatan is, uh, re receives a, a, a message that someone has been killed, in, or very often maybe 10 or 15 people killed, uh, usually by state forces, they send someone who they've trained up as a volunteer, and they go and take as, as, as much time as they can to get all the facts all and, and indicate the evidence and then make a report back. Um, something like 50 of those have been killed, uh, about 20 of, something like 20 under Duterte. Um, and they're invaluable, of course, to, to lawyers. So, um, yeah, paralegals are very important. There's one American, Brandon Lee, who was um, yeah. attacked by the military, uh, we believe. Uh, I think it's absolutely certain he was attacked by the military. Um, and he was uh, uh, paralyzed. Um, he lives in the States now. Um, but uh, his, his work with the local communities was, was really important. Uh, and particularly uh, about the environment, uh, because there's a lot of a lot of things going on there: land grabbing, illegal uh, logging, and so forth. And the police and the army are often involved in that. Um, so yeah, I mean, Brandon Lee is was a courageous man and remains so. And uh, people like that should be memorialized. We should we should remember them and support them in every way we can. Getting back to the point you made about uh, Australia and, and the UK and, and uh, the United States, I mean, Stephen Donziger is, yes. is is one of the victims. The man who got a you know seven, what was it ten million dollar uh, victory in, in a case against Chevron. Uh, or Chevron's um, predecessor that they took over, um, and he's been he's been terribly treated in in New York State, uh, disbarred, uh, had to wear uh, an ankle bracelet for I don't know a couple of years, uh, and in you know that 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 courts. Uh, that that dealt with him did so in a in a, a very unjust manner to say the least, uh, and not to be defamatory. Yeah, he... uh, here in here in Australia, uh, we have the case of Bernard Caleri and a number of others whistleblowers. Uh, in Caleri's case, he was um, the defense uh, attorney for a man who. Had uh, blown the whistle on Australian government spying on uh, the Timorese, East Timorese uh, negotiating team over oil uh, resources in the Timor Sea. And uh, as a result of the, of, of the, the uh, secretly planting a bug in the Timorese negotiators' Uh, room where they were discussing their position and Australia's position and their tactics and so forth. Uh, the Timorese were cheated out of uh, uh, a, a proper settlement. Uh, and Kaleri has, has been in, in legal uh, 
legal trouble for uh, a number of years, several years, uh, facing prison. He's a former attorney general in the Australian Capital Territory. Marvelous man, wonderful lawyer, doing the right thing. But uh, in the view of the state, uh, he, he was essentially a criminal. Well, law lawyers doing doing their job, doing the right thing, you know, defending uh, um, the rights of individuals or communities, or you know, I mean, increasingly uh, defending the environment because uh, that's the only habitat we have, right? Uh, yeah. the, the, but poses a great threat to increasingly uh, autocratic, or I would say even, you know, neo-fascist states. You know, like in the United uh, Kingdom where I live. The you know no one other than the uh, Secretary of Home Affairs you know the the basically the Crown Princess of the yeah. British government uh, you know Suela Braverman uh, that, that has made a um, a prof you know her profession attacking lawyers uh, standing up for refugees and asylum seekers and you know mi migrant rights and whatnot yeah she you know like says so something like you know a milder version of what you describe in the Philippines case, red tagging, right? And then she called them lefty lawyers, as if like, you know, the, uh, the social justice oriented lawyers are something yeah. to sneer on, right? So yeah. can you talk about this uh, red tagging and uh, yeah. also talk specifically about um, the, um, the comparative, um, you know, statistics around Duterte, uh, the, the Ayoyo and um, the uh, uh, Aquino, you know, the you know, almost uh, uh, one lawyer a day was killed uh, under Duterte, right? Or one lawyer yeah. a month, you know, that's a staggering number. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, well, you opened up a number of things um, with with um, with regard to the statistics. Uh, let me say that that. Uh, our monitoring committee uh, has found 70 cases in which lawyers were killed in six years. 21 survived the tax. So there were 91 attacks on lawyers. And there were another 20 on paralegal. Um, and yeah, I have the, the, the data here. Uh, so for Duterte, 70 killed in 72 months. Um, that's 0.97 per month. And his pre immediate predecessor, uh, uh, Benigno Aquino, Corey's son, 48 were killed in 72 months. So that's 0.67 per month. And thirdly, um, Gloria Macapagal Arroyo, 83 killed in 113.3 months. Um, which is a, a rate of uh, 0.74 per month. She, she, um, uh, her, her term was quite long um, because she, she was a vice uh, president. And when the previous uh, chap was impeached, uh, she took over his term. I mean, Estrada. Yeah, Estrada. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but it's it's quite interesting because the statistics show that that um, immediately Duterte uh, was elected and and actually uh, let me say this in his uh, presidential campaign he talked about killing all the drug users right saving the country by and he promised it would be done in six months. Uh, he, he was a bit of a blowhard, actually, but a lot of people, unfortunately, took him seriously. Um, but in the first year he uh, of his term, there were 16 lawyers killed. Sorry. There were 13 killed and three survived. In the first year under Marcos, one has been killed and six survive. So there are 16 attacks under Duterte and only seven under Marcos, which is really interesting. Um, but if you look at, at the years um, under, under Duterte, the 
in the first um, year, uh, the rate was was uh, very high. And then it dropped slightly in the next year. And then in 2018, it hit its peak. Uh, and then from that time on, it started to, to trend down downwards. And in the last um, six months, uh, it reached a, a total of um, only one killed and four survived. Now, it seems to me that that uh, Marcos is 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 running a quite different game as president from that of of Duterte. Duterte had promised to kill, kill, kill the criminals, mainly the druggies. Um, and so he hit them hard. Some authors have called it governing by killing. So he he hit them hard and then was able to, to uh, allow things to settle down and, and gradually trend down uh, very far. Marcos, on the other hand, is, uh, has come in and he's, 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 of course, in the shadow of his father, who was a dictator. So the one thing he has to do is establish a legitimacy. And unlike Duterte, who's, who was out there in, inspiring, and I have a quote from a policeman who said, yes, he inspired the, the violation of human rights with his, with his talk. Um, but Marcos uh, has to establish the legitimacy of his regime. So he isn't out there saying, kill, kill, kill. He's really saying, build, 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 invest. You know, if the economy is going to be fine. Uh, but that doesn't mean there aren't people being harassed and threatened. Uh, you know, he, he, every Philippine president more or less allows the, the generals, the army, and the police uh, a lot of scope. And they award them, promote them, give them bonuses for killings and so forth. So there's, you know, there's a... a an apparent legitimacy, uh, and uh, at the same time, there's a lot of nasty stuff still going on. Yeah, that nasty stuff. That, fortunately, uh, the killings of, of, of lawyers are uh, as, <laughs> uh, almost disappeared. Right. Yeah, but still, like it, it fits the uh, um, you know second component definition of your. Uh, oh yeah, you know, because the attacks are still there. The yeah, attacks the attacks are still there and like attempt to interfere with the lawyers' uh, let, activities. Let me let me say something about the the justice sec so called justice secretary, um, whose son, by the way, was uh, acquitted in a, in a trial over drugs. Uh, that's the way things work there. Um, uh, this this fellow. Um, uh, made a statement about about um, suspects lawyering up. They had a confessed, and then they, they got a lawyer and they recanted. Well, fair enough. Uh, let 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 the court find out what actually happened. But the fact that the Department of Justice secretary says, "Oh, these guys just lawyered up." Is, it's a real slur on the legal profession. But getting on to red tagging, um, that's, that's been going on in the Philippines for decades. And what it means is calling lawyers and others communists or communist supporters. Um, and even going to the extent of talking about communist terrorist groups, um, with which I was actually red tagged. Here in well, this country, you were banned from the Philippines for a while. Yeah, yeah, of course. All all foreigners who are supporting uh, the the resistance to uh, injustice in the Philippines are, I mean, I'm one of uh, a handful, literally, and I think there are five of us uh, who who've been banned because of our support for uh, lawyers and human rights defenders, the environment, you name it. Um, but let, let, let's talk about Myanmar a little bit. Um, 
one fascinating difference uh, between the Philippines and Myanmar, and also in, in a way Turkey, China, uh, and a number of other countries, in the Philippines, lawyers are killed. In those countries that I mentioned, and probably some others, uh, they're hardly ever killed. Um, mostly they're imprisoned, tortured, of course, as in the Philippines, they're tortured when they go to prison. Um, and I've often wondered why why that is. Um, and I think there, there are some, a couple of reasons for that. But I remember talking uh, one time to an IRA uh, volunteer, a, a soldier for the IRA in Northern Ireland. And he said that, and this is kind of gross actually, but he said it, it, it's better if the, the soldier that we shoot survives than dies because people tend to forget you know and and, and it, it fades away and the you know the media said you know the soldier killed but then they move on to something else but when the guy is is wounded um it, it's it's ever present and there's a lot of people who are concerned about it involved in it the, the memory is there so um I'm thinking that's that's one reason why these authoritarian governments uh, detain people uh, but don't kill. Uh, and I, 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 I don't know. What, what do you think? Is there a yeah? A kind I mean, of... I I have a number of uh, Burmese uh, lawyer friends and also legal scholars. You know, the minute the um, Coup, the coup took place on February 1st um, or, you know, 2021. That's like two and a half years ago. The, um, you know, th they hit the road. They had, to, they knew that, you know, they, they, they will be snatched, right? Yeah. Next, after the first line leaders of uh, the National League for Democracy and other, you know, prominent figures, uh, the lawyers are next and, leave, you know, and then law professors, you know, who were uh, actively providing support for human rights defenders, or even you know collaborating with their uh, lawyer mm -hmm. friends, uh, you know mm -hmm. who are outside academia but in courtroom, and they, you know they basically they went underground, you know not taking up arms, but they went into hiding, right? They went mm -hmm. into exile, and um, also uh, it, it seems to me that um, you know. The, the 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 Burmese regime is less afraid of um, lawyers standing up in court because uh, they don't have any pretense of the rule of law, summary execution. <laughs> you see what I mean? The court, the, the the sentencing is essentially, um, you know, based uh, done by the general staff and the top. Uh, you know, if if. Uh, if a, a defendant is a, a high-profile figure, sentencing will be determined by the military uh, junta, not the, the judges. You sure I mean? Yeah. So and that, 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 yeah. Sorry. That that that, that brings us to another difference uh, in comparing the two. I mean, in the Philippines, it's a, a kind of democratic system with you know with with. Uh, uh, a, a, a court system, many people say a court system is broken, but that, that's not true. Um, although <laughs> it, it has its cracks and there's an awful lot of, you know, trumped up cases and wrongful convictions and so forth. But it, uh, at least on the surface, uh, it, it appears to be a democratic country following the rule of law. But in Myanmar, uh, and and this this is historic, isn't it? It goes back to, at least to Ne Win in the sixties, yes, through the nineteen sixties. You know, the country yeah. was shut down and martial martial law, special courts, military tribunals, um, and that's you know closed to the public. And as you say, in the military, you know, the it's interesting. The special courts are inside the prison. That's right. Yeah, which, I mean, they, which, they don't, 
the junta doesn't make any pretense about the due process, right? Yeah. And the uh, a, lo a lot of defendants uh, have no legal representations. And, uh, you know, there, there's no Javier uh, Corpus or anything, you know. I mean, anything mm -hmm. that remotely resembles due process uh, is not there. Yeah, not, yeah. You know, and, and, and so yeah, the it, lawyers, it's the, 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 I, I, I was fascinated because today I was reading uh, the, that report, which has just come out from Human the Human Rights, Rights Watch. Yeah. yeah. And... Uh, in the military tribunals, it's closed to the public, of course. Uh, only the uh, military are, are the deciders. And in fact, the, the chair, uh, who's the, probably the senior general, uh, is the one who makes the, the decision, the, announces and, and, and indeed makes the decision. Um, they say there is an appeal, but apparently there's never been an appeal. Um, there are no lawyers um, in the in the special courts, and by the way, that's sort of like what what happened in in Syria. Um, I was on the People's Tribunal into the killing of journalists, and we looked at Syria, and uh, there's similarities there. Um, but in the in the in the special courts, uh, lawyers are allowed. Um, but they're to they're basically told what questions they can ask, and what they can't ask. And if they ask a question that they can't ask or not allowed to ask, they can be charged, and then they'll be in the special court. So if you're if you're a, a lawyer in uh, in Myanmar, uh, there's very very little opportunity to actually use your professional knowledge and experience and and skills there's there's just no such thing as a fair trial no due process no rule of law well i mean as as you know um uh, uh you know often journalists and lawyers that they uh, partner up you know particularly in in cases involving like a major breach of like uh, human rights and other yeah. civil and political yeah. rights and and, yeah. and lawyers in the case of, say, Aung San Suu Kyi, the, um, you know, essentially the imprisoned, uh, the, you know, the, the leader of the Democratic uh, National League for Democracy. I mean, basically, she was uh, the de facto head of state. You know, her lawyers are gagged. Uh, you know, they can't talk to, you know, uh, to the um, uh, to the media. And yeah. uh, I, I also, you know, I'm very sure that you know the the room where uh, that she will be allowed to access her lawyers, um, you know where, wherever she is, is completely mm. uh, bugged. You see what I mean? Yeah. There's no such thing yeah. that you expect as like you know uh, the lawyer client um, the privilege or protection of any sort, right? So yeah. what we are yeah. looking at, I mean, uh, uh, from what you described, like you know, the, despite all the uh, shortcomings and you know the the state, uh, you know, the murder of lawyers. Uh, Philippines does have a semblance of a uh, rule of law and then uh, a degree of uh, openness there, right? Like mm. the civil society is yeah. very vibrant. Yeah. The Burmese civil society cannot function. That's why the civil society is underground and taking our arms, <laughs> you know, yeah. fighting and uh, yeah. everywhere. And so, yeah. so I think, I think it maybe it's a, 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 a bit of a, uh, unfair comparison, um, you know, the, the, that we are making the Philippines, the judicial system, and uh, you know all the um, flaws in the the the, the post coup Myanmar and the judicial system there. You know, there's no rule of law, yeah. and so we have this like neo feudal, um, essentially absolutist dictatorship. You know, the top yeah. guy decides, you know, um, uh, everything. You know, advisors yeah. just are simply uh, Stalin's idiots. You know what I mean? Well, yeah, it, yeah. It's um, when when you say it's an unfair comparison, I understand what you mean. Um, there are there are great differences between the two. I mean, but we both know from the 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 the, the um, genocide of Rohingya. Uh, there's some nasty nasty people in charge there, and and as you say. 
no no real law. Um, as one of the lawyers says in that report, the law is what the military wants it to be. But I, I'd like to, I'd like to say about the Philippines, um, it depends on what area that you're talking about. If you're talking about contracts, you know, corporate law and so forth, that's you know fairly standard. An American or an Australian or an English lawyer would understand it, and many have gone there and practiced and so forth. But when you're talking about uh, the environment, protection, defending human rights and, and, and the environment, if you're talking about defending in, uh, in the midst of a drug war, defending people who are alleged, don't, don't forget, there have been something like 30 to 35,000 people killed on the streets who never, most of them never even arrested, let alone appeared in, in court. That's a staggering um, number. Yeah, well, and and of, and of course, uh, I want to actually move on because I, I think people would be in, asking themselves, who's doing this killing? And that is very clear in, in Myanmar, who is attacking the lawyers. I mean, it's, it's the state out now, the military and police, clearly. But in the Philippines, it's much more complicated. Um, but the drug war has, has, under Duterte uh, made a big difference. So uh, if you compare um, Duterte with his predecessor, um, you know, Aquino, the, the predecessor, 48 killed, uh, Duterte, 70 killed. There was a real increase there, and, and that was mainly the, the result of the, of the drug war. Um, and in the drug war, um, it, w one of the problems with knowing who's doing this is that the investigations are not not very competent. Not well; they aren't even done uh, in many cases. Um, so, and and almost no one has appeared in court. The impunity rate of impunity is very high. But it seems like the uh, syndicates. The drug syndicates, like in Mexico, uh, have have been involved in killing lawyers, but also uh, state forces, the police, less less the the army, but the army's in there as well. But the police have been involved in recycling drugs, protecting drug uh, groups, syndicates, or small organizations. Um, so and and that's one reason why Lila de Lima has been in jail for almost seven years, uh, more than six years certainly. Um, she was the one who who chaired uh, the Senate committee that investigated very early on, about six months in, I think, um, who who was involved in 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 the killings, and she got witnesses to come in and say, look, one woman in particular, my partner and his father were both killed in a police station. And they were assets of the police. They were uh, involved in a drug trade. Um, and in order to keep them quiet, they were killed. And the excuse was that they had reached for they had, they were trying to get the officer's gun, so he, they were shot. That's that's a very common excuse. Um, and the other the other the other excuse is what they call nan nanlaban, which means uh, essentially self defense. I had to shoot him uh, because he had a, he had a gun. He was going to kill me. Um, but okay, so. In, in the drug drug war, uh, anyone defending uh, a drug uh, a, a, a drug suspect, sorry, <laughs> yeah, well, any anyone defending a drug suspect, um, anyone prosecuting a police or army man for a killing, uh, any judge sitting on a drug case, all of them are potentially uh, targets of, of uh, either uh, the police, army, or a syndicate. 
Um, and then, in fact, some some I've got some some figures here. Um, of if if we look at um, uh, prosecutors, uh, quite a number of them were uh, handling drug cases. Same with judges. Um, there are then uh, the um, so the first category of is is drug related military police and the syndicates and then uh, another category of course is land disputes um uh, and in those cases it's usually the army that's involved um any any activists trying to to uh, halt uh, the grabbing of land trying to protect uh, the indigenous people on their land, they they're they're likely to be targets. Um, third, um, there's uh, well, human rights and and environmental defenders. We've we've talked about that. Any lawyer who's an advocate for human rights, Duterte was saying, "I'll kill the lawyers as well as the defenders." Um, and then there's a catch-all category uh, in which there are, you know, no, normal uh, crimes, um, personal uh, disputes between a neighbor and a, and a lawyer, um, uh, debts. One judge was was killed because he uh, he had run up a lot of uh, debts he wasn't prepared to pay. Um, and uh, one of the one of the the uh, unique ones was a love triangle. There was there was a a policeman who was having an affair with a police uh, um, officer, and the lawyer came and found him uh, messing about uh, at his home, and the the the, uh, the cop shot the lawyer. Um, so anyway, there are many reasons, and it's very hard to tell just exactly who is doing it. But I'd I'd say a, a majority of the the, the uh, drug cases uh, can be laid at the the feet of uh, the police or the army. Right. Yeah. Sorry. Like my my dog just uh, came into the room, and I had to keep him quiet. That's why my okay. Said. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. the, can I say there, there was another case? It, it was before Duterte, but it's an interesting one, and it, it shows the difficulty you have uh, as as a monitoring group in in determining uh, how to understand the case. There was a an elderly single judge. Um, who was killed in his bed, stabbed. And the question is, how do we understand that case? Who was involved? What was the motive? Was it because he was gay, a, a hate crime? Uh, since he was gay, uh, it could possibly have been a, a, a lover's spat, or it could have been uh, a decision that the, the judge had made um, could have been a robbery. Um, so that that is is uh, an, an example of of the difficulties we have, and sometimes the arguments we get into with with people about how to understand these killings. In fact, in that case, it was a robbery, and it was committed by his driver. Yeah, yeah, just uh, in, in the last uh, five minutes or so we have left, uh, I want to return to uh, the Myanmar or Burma, because, yep. you know, the, the Philippine case uh, has at least, um, you know, semblance of, um, of the, uh, the judiciary, you know, like, however it may be crippled. But in, in the case of Myanmar, we have a regime that had, um, you know, Commission essentially a textbook um, genocide, and then you know demonstrated, as you well know, the intent to commit um, you know a genocide against um, you know the multiple groups, religious and ethnic minorities, and so attacking lawyers is 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 for them is, is you know they don't even lose their sleep, right? And also you raise the issue of um, 
why do they not kill lawyers and but simply throw throw them in jail or uh, you know torture them during investigation right i i think the you know the, the burma has been on and off a vast uh, you know open prison since Nguyen's time in 1960s and we are littered or the country is littered the society is littered with the former political prisoners you know if you if you think of uh, the uh, you know the the uh, thousands of uh, burmese activists and as well as minority religious activists or citizens uh, that the regime targeted and tortured or jailed we're looking at um, a, a massive um, social burden you know these people they never come out uh, you know all right you know Mm -hmm. uh, flashback. It's like, you know, Vietnam vets and American society, you know, like we don't, I mean, it's maybe it's, it's, uh, it's not an accurate uh, uh, comparison, but the, the impacts of these um, prison experiences or experiences in interrogations, mm -hmm. uh, you know, they're, mm -hmm. they're extreme trauma. And so, you know, people walking around with massive, like, you know, profound trauma, we are talking about the equivalent of wounded soldiers. It slows down the society. It damages the society. You see what I mean? Mm. Well, you're yeah. talking about the uh, you know former uh, your conversation with the uh, IRA volunteer. You know, <laughs> okay, don't kill them. You know, like uh, they just uh, just wound <laughs> them, right? Just shoot them yeah. enough to 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 leave them uh, wounded or injured. Mm. And then I, I want to invite uh, the, the, your thoughts on. Um, on uh, one particular issue that has been troubling me. You know, you know, the Nelson Mandela and his uh, colleagues uh, rejected the uh, Pretoria's uh, jurisdiction, you know, when they were tried in the 60s and uh, made a political speech. And then, you know, um, uh, in a less honorable manner um, or situation, Saddam Hussein did the same with the uh, military tribunal, right? Basically, I don't recognize your authority, right? I, I, I've always been like wondering why Aung San Suu Kyi, you know, knowing the system as well as she does, goes along with this, you know, um, pretense or the charade of judicial process, even, uh, you know, securing lawyers and, you know, appearing in court instead of like taking Mandela's route, you know, <laughs> saying, we don't have a rule of law. We don't have an independent judiciary. So who is trying me and by what authority? Well, I have no right. I have no proper representation. My lawyers cannot speak to the media. I don't have a you know a, a lawyer client um, uh, privilege. So the, why do you think that she is stuck in that mindset that you have to respect the rule of law, whatever the regime? Well, uh, it's hard to get out of that mindset if you've, you know, if you've grown up in the elite and, and the, the, you know, with all the liberal ideology. Uh, it's uh, and, and I guess it's a question of, of hoping somehow that things will come out right if you do the right thing. Uh, but it hasn't turned out that way for her, has it? I mean, it's, it's ironic where she is now, once again, <laughs> uh, having turned her back on the genocide. Well, I mean, like, it, not just that. I mean, like, you know, during her period in, in, in power for five years, the first term, you know, her government was very hostile to, you know, whatever was presented to her as civil society representation or idea or advice. Mm. Uh, you know, the, the, she was also using the, um, the judiciary to go after her crit uh, critics and, mm. uh, you know, community mm. activists and, you know, the uh, farmers uh, standing up against the uh, uh, my Chinese mines and encroaching on their communal or agricultural land, that kind of thing. And so, you know, she, she wasn't exactly uh, the liberal defender of the rule of law. She was also using the law as a tool against her critics, you know, youth mm. and other mm. activists. Yeah, I, ironically, I think there's a lot of liberalism involved there. 
I mean, it, it's very hypocritical from start to finish, you know. Yeah. Um, and and then you were going to talk about um, the inter- declaring um, International Day for certain countries, right? And, yes. Um, the, the, you know, can can you um, uh, tell the listeners, uh, you know, the, what kind of uh, initiatives, a country specific, might help the uh, lawyers fighting for rights in their own respective countries, and also perhaps to make it, um, some kind of like a projection on you know, where this trend is leading all of us to, you know, as activists and citizens. Well, yeah, the day of the endangered lawyer uh, is January 24th. And uh, this year it was uh, focused on Afghanistan. And next year, January January, uh, 2024, it will be Iran. Uh, the Philippines has been the focus several times and uh, a number of other countries, Colombia and others. Um, and on that day and, or around that time, uh, around the globe, the, the mainly uh, legal professional organizations, but also lawyers individually and collectively, um, hold uh, various events, demonstrations in front of the countries embassy, uh, seminars, conferences, uh, and those are probably the most uh, common uh, events. Um, And uh, it would be nice for for you to have one. on. uh, Yeah, for Myanmar, I think we would definitely uh, uh, need one. One one thing that that the European lawyers are very good at um, and and, uh, others too, um, is observing at trials where where there are trials where lawyers um, are, are on trial in 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 <laughs> in, in public uh, trials. Uh, delegations of lawyers are 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 important, um, and um, um, yeah, the French in particular are, are strong in doing that. Um, the uh, the other another thing is a fact finding mission. Uh, groups of lawyers going to a country where they've been invited by the local lawyers who are under attack. Um, there have been many of these, um, and they're important because they 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 put some international pressure on the, on the government, and they also generally. Uh, produce a, a, a report which gets publicity usually in the media and um, this this is uh, about the only thing we can do really because what goes on in a country is up to you know is up to the struggle between the people and the state and you know we're on the side of the people uh, but as you say, I've been banned, and a number of my colleagues here in various solidarity groups have been banned from the Philippines. I'm sure who, I, none of us could get into Myanmar, and, and you know that's another comparison, I suppose. Is people do still get to go to the Philippines, not all of us, but some. So yeah, we have have to try to organize the the, the people both in the country and well support the people organizing in in the country, um, and organize outside. Thank you very much. Um, you've been listening to uh, Professor Beringer, uh, the uh, lead researcher for the uh, report on uh, attacks on the Philipp- uh, Filipino lawyers and also honor research fellow with the uh, School of Law at Macquarie University in Sydney, and also the co-chair or chair of the monitoring committee uh, of the International Association of People's Lawyers. Um, uh, thank you so much. And uh, it must be like a past 10 o'clock and I should let you have a good night rest. <laughs> thank you.